Welcome to Counter Apologetics. I'm your host, Emerson Green, and today we'll be discussing Darwin Devolves. Michael Behe recently published a new book, Attacking Evolution and Promoting Intelligent Design, Darwin Devolves. Behe also authored Darwin's Black Box, a creationist favorite, coined the phrase irreducible complexity, and was a key part of the Kitzmiller v. Dover trial in Pennsylvania, where it was ruled that intelligent design was not science and was religious in nature. He's also a senior fellow at a conservative think tank that promotes intelligent design called the Discovery Institute, or Disco-Toot, as Stephen Novella calls it. If you're not familiar, the Disco-Toot engineered the Teach the Controversy campaign that was aimed at smuggling creationism into biology education. The problems with his book begin with the title. Devolution or de-evolution is not a thing, as far as biology is concerned. Evolution just means change. If you gain eyes, that's evolution. If you lose eyes, that's evolution. De-evolution is only something you would say before you learned anything about evolutionary biology. As biologist Nathan Lentz wrote in his article for Skeptic Magazine, quote, I had never heard the word devolve or de-evolution used in a scientific context until I read this book. Be he means it as the opposite of evolution, which doesn't make much sense in biology. End quote. A word like de-evolution implies that there's a preferred direction to evolutionary change, as if there's a goal that we can progress towards or regress from rather than life simply changing over time, adapting to its environment. Species are not immutable, and this was a prevailing pre-Darwinian idea that had to be overcome in order to see the full evolutionary picture. Richard Dawkins, inspired by Ernst Mayer, has speculated that, quote, the dead hand of Plato was one of the culprits delaying the discovery of evolution. The ancient philosophical doctrine and natural psychological tendency of essentialism kept humanity from evolution even as we were grasping Newton's mathematical ideas, which seemed to be far more complicated and counterintuitive than evolution by natural selection. Essentialism is also the culprit behind a nonsensical word like de-evolution. For Plato, every triangle we see in the material world is an imperfect shadow of the true essence of triangle. There exists an ideal, essential triangle, and every triangle we see is but a shadow on the wall of our cave, an imperfect manifestation of the true, essential reality. And I'm quoting from Dawkins' book, The Greatest Show on Earth. Biology is plagued by its own version of essentialism. Biological essentialism treats tapirs and rabbits, pangolins and dromedaries, as though they were triangles, rhombuses, parabolas, or dodecahedrons. The rabbits that we see are shadows of the perfect idea of rabbit, the ideal, essential, platonic rabbit, hanging somewhere out in conceptual space. Flesh and blood rabbits may vary, but their variations are always to be seen as flawed deviations from the ideal essence of rabbit. How desperately unevolutionary that picture is. The Platonist regards any change in rabbits as a messy departure from the essential rabbit. The evolutionary view of life is radically opposite. Descendants can depart indefinitely from the ancestral form, and each departure becomes a potential ancestor to future variants. Indeed, Alfred Russell Wallace, independent co-discoverer with Darwin of evolution by natural selection, actually called his paper on the tendency of varieties to depart indefinitely from the original type. End quote. There is obviously a population that we can call the rabbit population, even though there is no standard essential rabbit that we can evolve towards or devolve away from. There can be a standard rabbit, but only in the sense that there is a center of a bell-shaped distribution of genes slash traits in a population, but it's determined by a cloud of rabbits, a population, rather than an essential platonic rabbit. The cluster of genes changes over time. What was once the far end of the distribution could be in the center later in history. Over geological time and a sufficient number of generations, there may be no overlap between the ancestral and descendant distributions. This is the evolutionary alternative to platonic rabbitiness, according to Marin Dawkins. Population thinking. Rather than an essential form, there is only an ever-shifting cloud of traits. As Dawkins puts it, there are only populations of furry, long-eared, coprophagous, whisker-twitching individuals, showing a statistical distribution of variation in size, shape, color, 
and proclivities. End quote. It's not that the word de-evolution has never been uttered before by an evolutionary biologist. It's just rarely, if ever, used, and when it is, it's in passing or employed as a shorthand. It's never given the centrality or technical importance that Behe gives it, for the reasons I've been outlining. It makes you sound like you don't understand evolution. Moving forward, I won't use creationism and intelligent design interchangeably. ID proponents don't like it, and they're actually not the same thing. Ken Ham, creationist, thinks that God made rabbits, humans, and trees. Michael Behe, intelligent design proponent, thinks that God made the biochemical parts that made rabbits, humans, and trees. Creationists just say God did it whenever they see something complex or seemingly purposeful. ID proponents say an intelligent designer did it whenever they see something like that. What's funny to me is how offended Behe seems to get when he's called a creationist. In an op-ed, the biologist Jerry Coyne referred to intelligent design as creationism in a cheap tuxedo, and Behe was indignant in a response post. There are different kinds of creationists. Not all of them think the Earth is 6,000 years old. And Behe happens to be the kind of creationist who accepts that the Earth isn't less than 10,000 years old, and also that all species are related via common ancestors. For Behe, and for all creationists, gaps in knowledge are simply filled with the designer, and his particular gaps have more to do with biochemistry and the mechanisms of evolution, rather than evolution itself. He doesn't believe in a young Earth, where all species have existed in their current form. He believes that natural laws can't account for evolution, and that a god is necessary to drive biological complexity and major evolutionary change. The central assertion of ID advocates is that biological life and our universe generally suggest design. An intelligent designer is required to explain the universe that we see. There is no way, they argue, that the world before us, with biological and cosmological complexity, could ever have arisen through natural processes. The evolution of matter over time, orchestrated by the laws of nature, could never create human beings. Nor could such impersonal, mindless processes give rise to the other wonders of our universe. That's been the claim since William Paley and the watchmaker argument, and even Aquinas and the argument from design. Today there's talk about irreducible complexity and genetic information, but the basic claim hasn't changed. We need a watchmaker to explain the complexity and apparent purpose we see. As for Darwin Devolves, the thesis of the book is an amalgam of a few old creationist canards, primarily that mutations are usually bad and macroevolution can't occur naturally. That's an oversimplification, and we'll get into the weeds of Behe's claims in a minute, but let me read what it says on his website. Quote, Dr. Behe shows that new scientific discoveries point to a stunning fact. Darwin's mechanism works by a process of de-evolution, not evolution. On the surface, evolution can help make something look and act different, but it doesn't have the ability to build or create anything at the genetic level. Critically analyzing the latest research, Behe gives a sweeping tour of how modern theories of evolution fall short and how the devolving nature of Darwin's mechanism limits them even further. End quote. This is not a new idea from creationists. It's being presented as new to sell a book, and they're emphasizing a catchy PR phrase, de-evolution, which is a word that will turn off anyone who knows anything about evolution, but that's not Behe's audience. First, it should be said that we cannot infer intelligent design from supposed flaws in Darwinism. Poking holes in another idea doesn't automatically lend credence to your idea. To quote Herbert Spencer, Those who cavalierly reject the theory of evolution as not adequately supported by facts seem to forget that their own theory is supported by no facts at all. End quote. It's a pretty standard God of the Gaps move to claim we don't know how X happens, therefore God. If there are gaps in our knowledge, or problems with Darwinism, real or imagined, we're not justified in leaping to intelligent design. A positive case must be made. Behe's case against Darwinism isn't very compelling and we can't infer design simply from flaws in Darwinism in the first place, let alone design from a specific god. It turns out that they do help them. There's lots of mutations that help, but the bottom line is that overwhelmingly, the mutations are ones that break things that were already there. They take genes that are working in some organisms and figuratively snap them and throw them away, and that helps in some circumstances. 
And people might wonder, you know, how, how can braking something help? Well, if you, uh, if you think of your car, suppose your life depended on you getting better gas mileage for your car. You know, what's a quick and easy way to get better gas mileage? Well, of course, you can throw things away. You can take off weight. You can take the doors and throw them away. Take the hood and throw it away. Of course, those are useful in some circumstances. But if right now your life depended on your car getting better gas mileage, uh, the way to go is to, is to throw those out. Nacelle does that too. I, I just imagine a lot of people are thinking, well, so what? In other words, if mutation is, the, the genetic code is broken here and that helps, what, what, why is that a problem for Darwinism? Well, because it shows that Darwin's mechanism is actually powerfully devolutionary rather than evolutionary. It strongly tends to break things, throw them away, like the example I talked about. And that's not going to be something that constructs sophisticated molecular machinery such as we found in the cell. Okay, so The central claim of Darwin devolves is, is that natural, uh, unguided changes in the gene sequence can sometimes be adaptive, that is, they increase fitness, but they can only diminish the function of genes. Mutations can never, quote, build or create anything at the genetic level. According to Behe, evolution should eventually grind to a halt without intervention from an intelligent designer. Quote, Not only is the Darwinian mechanism de-evolutionary, it is also self-limiting. That is, it actively prevents evolutionary changes at the biological classification level of family and above. End quote. In other words, macroevolution. He thinks that organisms left to nature alone will eventually stop changing and remain in the same form, that is, without the influence of something else, perhaps a designer. The reason for this can be summarized in what Behe describes as, quote, the central argument of the book. Quote, first rule of adaptive evolution. Break or blunt any gene whose loss would increase the number of offspring. He continues, the rule summarizes the fact that the overwhelming tendency of random mutation is to degrade genes, and that very often is helpful, increasing helpful broken and degraded genes in the population. End quote. In order to understand Behe's arguments, we need to separate two similar sounding concepts, adaptation and gain of function. Adaptive simply means aiding in survival and reproduction, which may or may not include a gain in function. Function can be maladaptive depending on the environment, so disabling a function that has a deleterious effect would increase genetic fitness, even though it would degrade genetic function. When Behe claims that adaptation often breaks genes, he's referring to protein encoding genes that are no longer producing proteins because of mutation. This can often be adaptive, but Behe wants to see adaptive gains of function, not just adaptations. He's claiming that random mutation is unable to create genetic gains of function, or lead to evolutionary change, quote, at the level of family and above. According to Behe, gains of genetic function would rarely occur by random mutation and natural selection. Intelligent intervention is required for innovation and adaptive gains of function on the genetic level. To be clear, he believes that macroevolution has in fact occurred, and that adaptive gain of function mutations have occurred. He just believes that natural processes cannot account for these facts. Well, he thinks that natural processes can be imagined that could explain these facts, but there's no evidence that those explanations are anything but just-so stories, or unverifiable narratives. I'm sorry if any of that was confusing, but Behe's thesis is somewhat confused. He makes confident, sweeping assertions before hedging and backpedaling if he's pressed. You never know which empirical data he'll accept, or which he'll wave away as fake or unimportant. Behe himself is a strange transitional fossil between creationism and acceptance of evolution. As science has pressured religion to change over the decades and centuries, some have doubled down and others have conceded points here and there. Michael Behe isn't more sophisticated, he's just conceded different points than most other creationists. Let's back up a step and go over some basic evolutionary biology to make sure we can fully understand where he's coming from and where he goes wrong. The basic Darwinian picture is that rather than by purposeful design, biological systems evolved over time, driven primarily by natural selection. 
While natural selection is certainly not a random process, it acts on a mass of random, unplanned, chance variations. These variations are conserved or eliminated over time by natural selection, and this process produces organisms that are exquisitely adapted to their environmental niches, which can create a powerful illusion of purposeful design. The raw ingredients for evolution are replicators making copies of themselves, and these copies aren't exact copies of the parent replicators, resulting in variation within the population. The environment determines which traits are adaptive, which are deleterious or maladaptive, and which are neutral. Adaptive simply means aiding in survival and reproduction. A trait that is maladaptive is harming the gene's continued existence, or lowering the amount of copies of itself it will contribute to the next generation in that particular environment. Once we have replication, variation, and time, we can have differential success in survival and reproduction, evolution by natural selection. And by replicators, I mean just that, stuff that can make crude copies of itself. Traits of the parent are passed on to the offspring. Variation simply means that the replicators are not all identical. Some have traits that others do not, and depending on the environment they happen to find themselves in, these differences will cause different outcomes regarding survival and reproduction. In other words, how long you exist, and how many copies of your genes you pass on to the next generation. Not all replicators in the population survive and produce offspring. Some die before they reproduce, others never produce viable offspring. Who survives and passes genes on to the next generation is not random, but depends on the traits of the organism and the environment it finds itself in. Each successive generation yields minor changes, and over time, these changes accumulate. This was the final clue, a relationship between the environment and the reproduction of populations. Darwin reasoned that living beings compete over resources, and only the most fit for a given region survive. It's as if nature selects them, hence his choice of the term natural selection for the primary mechanism of evolution. Compare this to natural theology. There's no creator involved, species aren't fixed, the process takes eons, and design? What design? Useful traits emerge over time. At the same time that he was working on... To clear up a common problem, misunderstanding, fittest doesn't mean like the biggest, Darwin. strongest, meanest, or least altruistic. It could, depending on the environment, but it's not implied by fit in survival of the fittest. The fittest in a given environment could be the most altruistic and most social. It could mean having a slightly different shaped beak than your neighbors. It could mean being able to withstand intense heat or cold. What's adaptive is determined by the environment, and environments vary greatly. To clear up another common misunderstanding, mutants are not monsters, or X-Men. Outside of biology, mutant or mutation are freighted terms and carry a slightly negative connotation, contributing to all kinds of unjustified fear over GMOs, gene editing, as well as fueling the common misconception among creationists that mutations are inherently harmful, or involve drastic changes to the organism. Be he doesn't make that exact mistake, it's just worth mentioning since creationists generally seem to be working more with the colloquial definition of mutant than the biological one. As I mentioned earlier, we need to separate gain of function and adaptation. Adaptive simply means aiding in survival and reproduction, how long it exists and how many copies it makes which may or may not include a gain in function. Calling attention to adaptive loss-of-function mutations has been a hobby horse of Behe's for several years now, and it's included in his so-called first rule of adaptive evolution. In a paper from 2010, he reviewed lab evolution in viruses and bacteria, surveying which kinds of adaptive mutations, loss or gain of function, tend to occur. Darwin Devolves is actually based on his 2010 paper, and you can see his thesis taking form. Quote, adaptive evolution can cause a species to gain, lose, or modify a function. It is of basic interest to determine whether any of these modes dominates the evolutionary process under particular circumstances. Because mutation occurs at the molecular level, it is necessary to examine the molecular changes produced by the underlying mutation in order to assess whether a given adaptation is best considered as a gain, loss, or modification of function. Although that was once impossible, the advance of molecular biology in the past half century has made it feasible. In this paper, I review molecular changes underlying some adaptations with a particular emphasis on evolutionary experiments with microbes conducted over the past four decades, 
I show that by far the most common adaptive changes seen in those examples are due to the loss or modification of a pre-existing molecular function. End quote. It's not 100% clear in Darwin Devolves whether Behe claims that adaptive evolution can never cause a gain in function, or that it only very rarely causes a gain in function. Nathan Lentz indicates in his skeptic article that Behe is claiming the former, never a gain in function. As Lentz has noted, however, Behe will hedge his claims if he's under pressure. Michael Behe wrote in February 2019 that it's merely the, quote, overwhelming tendency of random mutation to degrade genetic function, rather than an absolute rule. We'll deal with both potential options later on to be as thorough as possible. So this next point is important. In fact, Behe says that it's the overwhelmingly important point. So let me read his brief rebuttal to criticism he posted on evolutionnews.org the Conservapedia of Science websites, quote, The overwhelmingly important point to notice right up front is that the reviewers have absolutely no response to the very central argument of the book, the argument that I summarized as an epigraph on the first page of the book so no one could miss it, the one that I included in the title of a 2010 quarterly review of biology article upon which the book is based the one for which I chose the most in-your-face moniker I could think of, consistent with a professional literature, to go to response. The first rule of adaptive evolution, break or blunt any gene whose loss would increase the number of offspring. The rule summarizes the fact that the overwhelming tendency of random mutation is to degrade genes, and that this is very often helpful. Thus, natural selection itself acts as a powerful de-evolutionary force, increasing helpful broken and degraded genes in the population, and they had no response. That's because there is, in fact, nothing that can alleviate that fatal flaw in Darwinism. End quote. This is not exactly a fatal flaw in Darwinism. Behe's first rule of adaptive evolution, which is the central argument of the book, and the main thing Behe wants a response to, further exposes his lack of understanding when it comes to evolutionary biology. To quote Stephen Novella, creationists don't understand evolution. The fundamental problem with Behe's first rule of adaptive evolution is that it confounds frequency and importance, as biologist Richard Lenski puts it. Behe isn't wrong when he claims that the majority of mutations are not adaptive, and he's also not wrong when he says most mutations don't add function. He overstates how overwhelming the tendency is in both cases, but he's not wrong. To quote Lenski, I would tone down Behe's rule as follows. The tendency of random mutation is to degrade genes, and that is sometimes helpful. Many mutations are selectively neutral or so weakly deleterious as to be effectively invisible to natural selection. While loss of function mutations are sometimes helpful to the organism, I wouldn't say that's very often the case. And even those degradative mutations that are not helpful on their own sometimes persist and occasionally serve as stepping stones on the path towards new functionality. Behe then asserts the power of the de-evolutionary process of gene degradation. This is an unjustifiable extrapolation, yet it's central to Darwin Devolves. It's not the sort of error I would expect from anyone who's deeply engaged in an earnest effort to understand evolutionary science and present it to the public. And Lenski continues, Yes, natural selection sometimes increases the frequency of broken and degraded genes in populations, but when it comes to the power of natural selection, what is most frequent versus most important, can be very different things. End quote. Let's take Behe at his word for the moment that he intends to say that the overwhelming tendency of random mutation is to degrade genes, not that random mutation can only degrade genes. He seems to think that the adaptive gains of function would be swamped by the more numerous loss of function mutations. But this is seriously not how natural selection works, for the reasons Lenski was outlining. Anything that is adaptive, by definition, will succeed in making copies of itself. Evolved over time. They quote a Frenchman about how the Polynesian canoe evolved over time. Every boat is copied from another boat. Let's reason as follows in the manner of Darwin. It's clear that a very badly made boat will end up in the bottom after one or two voyages, thus never be copied. One could then say with complete rigor that it is the sea herself who fashions the boats, choosing those which function and destroying the others. If it comes back, copy it. That's natural selection. Doesn't require any particular comprehension. You don't have to be a naval architect. You follow that rule, and the boats are going to gradually get better. You may make some mutations 
Most of your mutations may make worse boats. Doesn't matter. Any that happen to make better boats, that will be copied and so forth. The point is that gain of function mutations don't need to happen the majority of the time in order to proliferate. That's not how natural selection works. If there's a valuable gain of function, those genes will make lots of copies of themselves. That's what it means to be adaptive. This is why Lenski said the first rule of adaptive evolution confuses frequency and importance. So as long as adaptive gains of function can happen some of the time, there is no problem, let alone a fatal flaw in Darwinism, especially since new functions can be produced through a variety of means, another fact that Behe doesn't adequately deal with in his book. I'm not sure why it took us so long to get here, but Behe doesn't seem to acknowledge that mutation is not the only source of variation. And this was the second time after seeing the title of the book itself that I thought I must be misunderstanding Behe. How could he be that wrong? I must not understand what he's actually trying to say, since the idea that mutation is the only source of variation could be cleared up with an introductory biology textbook. But try as I might, I can't see any indication that he's using the word de-evolution anything but sincerely. And try as I might, I can't find any evidence that he thinks there are ways to get variation other than mutation. By mutation, he probably just means any change in the DNA sequence, regardless of how it changed. If that's not how he's using the term, then this is a bizarre oversight. I've never heard biologists use mutation as an umbrella term for recombinant shuffling, horizontal gene transfer, random point mutation, and so on, but I'm choosing to be charitable here. After all, Darwin Devolves is intended for a popular audience, but you'd still think he'd mention other sources of variation, since his whole case is based on evolution not being able to create new functions. He even has a section in his book entitled Variation, and in it, he only discusses mutation, no mention of recombination or anything else, just mutation, and a skeptical depiction of the role it could play in generating variation, and of course, creating new functions. Remember, variation is critical in evolution. It's the raw material for natural selection to work with. Since we're not all identical, we'll have differential success in obtaining limited resources, and surviving and making copies of our genes. One source of variation is recombination, which is what it sounds like, the recombination of genetic material between different organisms, creating offspring with combinations of traits that differ from those found in either parent. The word recombination appears only once in the entire book. Exaptation is also relevant here, when there's a shift in the function of a trait. Natural selection produces adaptations and byproducts, which can be co-opted for new use. The word exaptation doesn't appear once in the entire book. He acknowledges the process by other names, like the principle of tinkering. I have no idea why he wouldn't just use the word exaptation, especially since so many consider it to be a decisive blow to irreducible complexity. Horizontal gene transfer, when genetic material is exchanged between organisms by something other than the transmission of DNA from parent to offspring, is also not adequately dealt with despite the fact that both horizontal gene transfer and exaptation, as Nathan Lentz puts it, are, quote, key forces in generating diversity and innovation. Michael Behe's criticisms of Darwinism so far have fallen flat. His extrapolations from his first rule of adaptive evolution, break or blunt any gene whose loss would increase the number of offspring, misunderstand natural selection, and confound frequency and importance, to quote biologist Richard Lenski. Gain of function mutations don't need to happen the majority of the time in order to proliferate, any more than adaptive mutations need to happen more frequently than maladaptive mutations to proliferate. How consequential something is, and how common it is, are two distinct questions. As Lenski dryly notes, asteroid impacts aren't common either, but the dinosaurs, among other groups, sure felt the impact of one at the end of the Cretaceous. As an analogy, consider the formation of mountains. Large-scale movements of the Earth's tectonic plates are required for mountain formation. Many geological processes, however, are constantly at work, and they don't all conspire to build up mountains. Take erosion. Erosion can, over time, drastically change the landscape, including mountains and it's far more frequently involved than large-scale, drastic movements of the Earth's crust. Behe is essentially claiming that unless tectonic plates form mountains more often than erosion is at work, erosion would swamp the effect of the tectonic plates 
and no mountains would ever form, that is, without the intervention of an intelligent designer. The thesis of Behe's book can be summarized in a quote of his from part one. The first rule of adaptive evolution summarizes the fact that the overwhelming tendency of random mutation is to degrade genes, and that very often is helpful. Thus, natural selection itself acts as a powerful de-evolutionary force, increasing helpful broken and degraded genes in the population. End quote. This is the central argument of the book, as Behe said, and as I hope I've explained by now, it's not a good argument. Richard Lenski drove the point home with another useful analogy. Quote, when it comes to the power of natural selection, what is most frequent versus most important can be very different things. What is most important in evolution, and in many other contexts, depends on timescales and the cumulative magnitude of effects. Consider an investor who bought stocks in 100 different companies 25 years ago, of which 80 have been losers. 20 winners can overcome 80 losers. Imagine if that investor had picked Apple, for example. That single stock has increased in value by well over 100-fold in that time, more than offsetting even 80 total wipeouts all by itself. In the same vein, even if many more mutations destroy function than produce new functions, the latter category has been far more consequential in the history of life. That is because a new function may enable a lineage to colonize a new habitat or realm, setting off what evolutionary biologists call an adaptive radiation that massively increases not only the number of organisms, but over time, the diversity of species, and even higher taxa. End quote. Since Behe's criticisms don't hold water, in even more ways that we'll get to soon, it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that he's arguing in favor of intelligent design. The design inference is an extra step made after the criticisms of evolution. Making the inference to design from any criticism of Darwinism is an unjustified leap. You can point out gaps in our knowledge without appealing to magic to fill those gaps. Let's turn to Behe's empirical claim here, that we know most mutations cause a loss of function, and that we know most adaptations cause a loss of function. He focuses on lab experiments to support these claims. Experimental evolution, evolution observed in labs, usually involve bacteria or viruses or fruit flies, and this is extremely valuable. But one wouldn't necessarily be justified in extrapolating conclusions drawn from those experiments to all of evolution in all of nature. Jerry Coyne points this out in his analysis of Behe's 2010 paper that the book is based on. Quote, I think that while Behe's summary of the results of these short-term lab experiments is generally accurate, one would be completely off the mark to extend his conclusions to evolution in general, that is, evolution as it has occurred in nature be it in microbes or eukaryotes. End quote. Further empirical difficulties for Behe are the numerous examples of non-broken genes that increase fitness. To quote Jerry Coyne again, these include the arising of duplicated genes and then the divergence of those genes to perform new functions on top of old ones, a very common mode of adaptation in nature that has created many useful gene families. End quote. Michael Behe knows this, and he admits that mutation and natural selection can explain microevolution, and maybe a little more than that, but only through the breaking of genes. Something else, he insists, is required for meaningful innovation and increased complexity. For Science Magazine, Nathan Lentz writes, quote, Behe dedicates the better part of Chapter 7 to discussing a 65,000-generation E. coli experiment, emphasizing the many mutations that arose that degraded function in expected mode of adaptation to a simple laboratory environment, by the way, while dismissing improved functions, and deriding one new one as a quote, sideshow. Behe is skeptical that gene duplication, followed by random mutation and selection, can contribute to evolutionary innovation. Yet there is overwhelming evidence that this underlies trichromatic vision in primates, olfaction in mammals, and developmental innovations through the diversification of Hox genes. And in 2012, Anderson showed that new functions can rapidly evolve in a suitable environment. Behe acknowledges none of these studies declaring an absence of evidence for the role of duplications in innovation. End quote. The evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne also provided several counterexamples of mutations increasing fitness without breaking genes, echoing many of Lentz's examples. Quote, Behe ignores the large number of adaptive mutations that do not inactivate genes. These include duplications, in which a gene is accidentally copied twice, with the copies diverging in useful ways, 
This is how primates acquired our three-color vision, as well as different forms of hemoglobin. Change is not in gene function, but in how and when a gene is turned on and off, like mutations producing lactose tolerance in milk-drinking human populations. There's the repurposing of ancient genes acquired from viruses, one source of the mammalian placenta. Chimeric genes cobbled together from odd bits of DNA, for example genes producing antifreeze proteins in fish blood, and simple changes in the DNA sequence that alter proteins without breaking them, for example tolerance of low oxygen levels in high-flying geese. End quote. So Coyne and Lentz just gave us examples of genetic mutations that don't break genes, are adaptive, and add function. So how does Behe deal with these examples that undermine his claims empirically? He accuses the authors of question-begging and merely providing just-so stories, which is a spectacular act of projection. He says that in these supposed counterexamples, the authors, quote, simply describe the occurrence of genes. The authors of the articles don't even try to argue, let alone experimentally investigate, that the diversification and integration of the genes into slightly different functions could have occurred through blind Darwinian processes, end quote. It's true that biologists have a high enough credence in their theories that they don't have a creationism versus evolution debate with every single new discovery, which is apparently what Behe wants, just like doctors don't have a debate over the possible demonic causes of miscarriage every time they see a new one. They just assume that it fits into the paradigm they've been working with and making steady progress with, and not the paradigm that they had to toss aside to make any of the progress that's been made. I would also argue that our credence in naturalism is high enough generally that we can confidently err on the side of natural laws and processes over unseen minds invisibly controlling the world's events, like we used to believe regarding miscarriage, earthquakes, disease, and like many of us still believe regarding biological complexity. I don't know what evidence be he would possibly be satisfied with. You show him examples in nature and in the lab of gains of function, and he accepts them but he asserts that an invisible agent must have done it. Biologists have responded with natural accounts of the examples cited, and he has said in multiple responses on evolution news that they're, quote, too vague, unlike it was a miracle, which is very clear and well-defined. You show him examples, and he wants an explanation. You give him an explanation, and he demands to see examples. Both have been brought to his attention to no avail. We need to separate a few things for clarity. First, there's an empirical claim regarding the tendency of mutations to break genes. Behe can be challenged on the specifics of his claims there, but he really goes off the rails when he says that natural selection is a de-evolutionary force because of the first fact. This comes down to Behe not understanding natural selection, and refusing to accept any counterexamples to his claims, which brings us up to where we are now. I should also mention that he goes on from this point to claim that since natural selection can't be the only mechanism, there's probably a designer, and this is even more of a wild extrapolation than his claim that selection is de-evolutionary. Even if natural selection isn't enough, this doesn't mean that the other forces at work couldn't also be physical and natural. It's possible to separate his negative and positive claims, which shouldn't be overlooked. It's quite possible to think that there's more to evolution than random mutation and natural selection while remaining a naturalist. His negative arguments against Darwinism are entirely separable from his positive claims of design. If he's claiming that his opponents are being too vague in their explanations, he may be wrong, but it's not an argument against that charge to point out the extreme vagueness of his own explanation. His model literally involves miracles, and he's upset Whatever with the vagueness of others. That's where the miracle intervene. It reminds me of Sidney Harris's famous cartoon, my favorite. Uh, where the one scientist writes up there in the st step two, then a miracle occurs, and he says, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. The problem with all creationist argument, and this is probably the most important slide I'll put up tonight, is that it is nothing more than a God of the gaps argument. That is, wherever there's a gap, that must mean that's where the miracle happened. That's where God intervened, or if you're an intelligent designer... All this to say that one could accept every single argument be he makes against Darwinism without buying into design. Such a person would just have to add other natural mechanisms driving evolution. So let's return to the issue at hand, which is his refusal to acknowledge examples of adaptive, gain-of-function mutations that don't break genes as natural phenomena. His problem with the numerous examples provided is that the authors, quote, simply describe the occurrence of genes, 
arrogantly assuming the explanation for them is something natural rather than the Holy Spirit, and without even trying to prove God's non-existence before discussing their genetics research. This is apparently question-begging, if you ask Michael Behe. I'm just barely joking. Behe does consider it unfair to assume there is a non-miraculous explanation as a default. As for the sufficiency of natural processes to drive evolution, there is literally no evidence we could show him that would change his mind. Even if we somehow showed him the emergence of every new gene, down on the chemical level, over the last few billion years, he still wouldn't be satisfied. That's because he doesn't have an issue with evolution itself, he just doesn't think natural processes can account for the emergence of all those genes. So that means we have to give him a naturalistic account of evolution, which has been done, but he'll never be satisfied with any explanation or any evidence, which we'll discuss momentarily. Fundamentally, Behe is driven by his intuition that God is the designer of the biological complexity he observes. Let's say that I had a strong intuitive feeling that the movement of the planets was intelligently guided. I say that unintelligent gravitational fields are not up to the task. It must be an angel driving the planets around. Obviously, I don't have a problem with the fact that the planets are moving. I just don't accept that blind Newtonian processes could ever account for the Earth's orbit around the sun. B. He doesn't have a problem with the fact of evolution, just like I don't have a problem with the motion of the planets. But what evidence could you possibly bring to my attention that could change my mind? If you showed me, in the sharpest possible detail, all the physical processes that conspire to make the planets orbit, it wouldn't change my mind because I don't dispute the movement of the planets. I dispute that unintelligent processes are up to the task of moving the planets on such a perfect path. No empirical data even could be problematic for my angel hypothesis. But what if a proposed naturalistic theory was spectacularly successful in predicting future data? Any naturalistic theory, no matter how successful in making accurate predictions, couldn't be waved away if we're reasoning as Behe does. But why does Behe accuse us of assuming our conclusion when all we're doing is making conjectures and testing them against reality? That's how science works. That's what it does. You build a model that makes predictions and compare it to the data. If the model's predictions are accurate, and it survives other classical measures, like simplicity and parsimony, we gradually accept the model tentatively to be true. But no model is ever proven to be true. Science doesn't do that, and yet that seems to be where Behe is setting the bar. He seems upset that natural selection, or natural processes generally, haven't been positively proven to be the true mechanisms of evolution. But that's not what science is in the business of doing. To quote Richard Feynman, Suppose that you invent a good guess, Calculate the consequences and discover that every consequence that you calculate agrees with experiment. The theory is then right? No, it is simply not proved wrong. Because in the future, there could be a wider range of experiments, you could compute a wider range of, co of consequences, and you may discover then that the thing is wrong. That's why laws like Newton's laws for the motion of planets last such a long time. He guessed the law of gravitation, calculated all the kinds of consequences for the solar system and so on, compared them to experiment, and it took several hundred years before the slight error of the motion of Mercury was developed. During all that time, the theory had been failed to be proved wrong and could be taken to be temporarily right, but it can never be proved right because tomorrow's experiment may succeed in proving what you thought was right wrong. So when you build a model that's successful in predicting data, it's not proven true. It's tentatively accepted as true. We don't claim that it's absolutely true, when it's seemingly confirmed by observation. This is why Behe's charges are so baffling. He'll accuse Darwinists of simply assuming their model is true if they don't positively prove their model is true, which science is not capable of doing. So to recap, no empirical data, even in principle, could change his mind. There is no conceivable evidence that could convince him of a natural view of evolution or falsify his model of design. No naturalistic theory will ever convince him, no matter how successful it is, unless it does more than make accurate predictions, explain all the data we observe, make the fewest assumptions, avoid contradicting other knowledge we have a high credence in, and fail to be proven wrong, which is outside the bounds of science. Does his model that he's proposing even begin to meet these standards? No, of course not. He's only this much of a skeptic when it comes to Darwinism. If he were consistent in this regard, he would have to throw out a lot more than evolutionary biology. For Behe, there are higher standards for ideas he doesn't like, and lower standards for ones he does. Reading Michael Behe over the past month has been challenging. 
in part because his thinking and writing is extremely muddled. He seems to contradict himself a lot, and flip-flops depending on whatever is most convenient for him at the moment. He also accuses his opponents of doing things he clearly does, like assume his conclusion, offer vague explanations, and make unfalsifiable claims. We need to clear something up here. Can natural, unguided processes only lead to loss of function mutations? Or is it rather the tendency of natural processes? Does Behe mean to claim that all genetic gains of function that have occurred are from the intelligent designer, or that only some of them are? It's not clear which one he actually believes, so let's cover both options. Option 1. Natural processes aren't up to the task of generating new function, ever. All genetic gains of function are from the intelligent designer. To quote Behe, It never ceases to amaze me that Darwinists are unable to separate the question of what happened from the question of how it happened. Okay, flightless dinosaurs had feathers and birds can now fly. And he's referring to an example of exaptation there. So what exactly is the evidence that it happened by a Darwinian process? What is the evidence that a Darwinian process could even, say, differentiate owls and crows from a common ancestor? Unintelligent processes aren't remotely up to those tasks. End quote. So, consistently holding to option one would mean that Jesus Christ himself was wandering invisibly around the labs at MSU and playing with E. coli. If we set aside for the moment the strangeness of what's being offered here, the first problem with this option is that it's completely unfalsifiable. It's compatible with all possible observations. If I show you a genetic gain of function, you can just say, ah oh, yes, that must have been God just like I could see the motion of the earth and say it must have been the angel. And if I give you any naturalistic account, you can just accuse me of begging the question. Moreover, there is no scientific test for design. It entirely comes down to your intuition. If I were to show you a gain of function in E. coli at Michigan State University, you can just plug your ears and deny that it exists as a counterexample, as B. he seems to be doing when he dismisses it as a sideshow. Or you can bite the bullet and accept that God must have done it since unintelligent processes aren't supposed to be up for such tasks. Let's say I gave you numerous examples in nature, like trichromatic vision in primates and antifreeze proteins in the blood of arctic fish. You could just say, ah oh, yes, God must have done that. Why? Because you've already decided that any adaptive gain in function must be from the intelligent designer. If I give you examples, you can just assert that I've failed to separate the what from the how. If I then give you an explanation that could at least in principle explain the examples, you can dismiss that explanation as a just-so story because I haven't logically proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's the right explanation. This is another area in which Behe is constantly contradicting himself. Do Darwinists have an explanation that could, at least in principle, explain what we observe? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So now let's take option two, which seems more reasonable at face value. It's not that natural processes can only degrade genes, it's just the tendency of random mutation and other natural processes to degrade genes. This means that only some fraction of the gain of function mutations are from the intelligent designer. Some are from natural processes, some are from the designer. The first question is why natural processes couldn't account for all the adaptive gains if they can account for some of them. If he's agreeing that Darwinists have an explanation for some adaptive gains of function, which he sometimes does and sometimes does not, is there any particular reason he's looking at other adaptive gains of function and claiming there's no way unintelligent processes could have produced them? He has two reasons, as far as I can tell, for why natural processes cannot explain all adaptive gains of function. One, because most mutations don't add new function, which doesn't matter at all and betrays his misunderstanding of natural selection. The other reason is that some of these structures are irreducibly complex, according to his intuitive powers. This also serves as the test for distinguishing godly from ungodly mutations. After all, it's natural to ask, once we've accepted that some adaptive gains are from the designer and some are from natural processes, how be he can tell the difference. This is why I felt it was necessary to discuss irreducible complexity before discussing the book. The notion of irreducible complexity has been debunked about a thousand times, and Darwin even anticipated arguments like it in later editions of The Origin. Irreducible complexity can't be an argument in favor of God's intervention, 
and it can't be the criterion for distinguishing mutations from the designer and mutations from purely natural processes. Remember Behe's underlying circular reasoning? We know a system is irreducibly complex if it performs a function that relies on multiple interacting parts that are purposefully arranged. Since there is no scientific test for purposeful, and it begs the design question to assert that these are purposeful arrangements, since purpose can only come from a mind with an intention, Behe claims that if the parts are, quote, ordered to perform some function, they must be purposeful. But natural selection can do this too, that is, order parts to perform function. And even Behe admits it, like in the case of antifreeze proteins in the blood of arctic fish, which some creationists have mistakenly claimed to be irreducibly complex, even against what Behe thinks. We need some way to distinguish between parts ordered to perform a function that were produced by natural selection and those that were created by a designer. How do we distinguish? Well, the ones that are irreducibly complex couldn't have been produced by natural selection. Irreducible complexity, purpose, function, irreducible complexity, and around and around we go. As I've tried to make clear, Behe doesn't reject evolution so much as he rejects that anything other than magic could have caused evolution. Sure, evolution occurred, but was it driven by natural processes, like selection? He accepts that evolution occurred, but unintelligent processes aren't up to the task. What brings him to this conclusion? Really, it comes down to his intuition when he's looking at something complex. It certainly isn't because there aren't plausible theoretical accounts of how it could happen, as he sometimes admits. Behe concedes that naturalists have an explanation for how these things could have happened, but he calls them just-so stories. Behe, on the other hand, is not at all providing a just-so story when he looks at something complicated, throws up his hands, and says God must have done it. Nor is he a creationist, so don't call him that. To quote Lentz, Behe asserts that new function can only arise through purposeful design of new genetic information, a claim that cannot be tested. By contrast, Modern evolutionary theory provides a coherent set of processes, mutation, recombination, drift, and selection, that can be observed in the laboratory and modeled mathematically, and are consistent with the fossil record and comparative genomics. End quote. Biologists are not imagining up baseless narratives that can't be tested. They're making falsifiable predictions based on theory that's based on observation that they then go out and test. In other words, science which is not something Behe seems very interested in doing. If he wants to incessantly claim that these coherent, testable, and empirically supported models are vague, unverifiable narratives that make unwarranted assumptions, if he's so troubled by these things, it would be nice to hear why his explanation of it was a miracle is less vague and less of a just-so story than duplication, mutation, recombination, drift, acceptation, and so on and so forth. I'm not holding my breath. Darwin devolves, Michael Behe claims that most mutations cause a loss or modification of function, rather than a gain. This claim can be questioned on the ground that he's scaling up some experimental evolution to all of evolution in nature. But the bigger issue here is his assertion that because we know most mutations are loss or modification of function, evolution will come to a halt without a designer. That evolution would come to a halt does not follow. It's based on a misunderstanding of natural selection. Even if most mutations don't add function, that doesn't mean new function cannot arise. Be he either misunderstands or underestimates natural selection. Gain of function mutations don't need to happen the majority of the time in order to cause major evolutionary change, any more than adaptive mutations need to happen more frequently than maladaptive mutations to proliferate. As I mentioned earlier, how consequential something is and how common it is are two different questions. And even if Behe managed to establish that Darwinism could not, even in principle, explain all that we observe, the design inference would not be justified by that fact alone. It does not follow that the solution to his imagined problem could only be an intelligent designer. And historically, that explanation doesn't have a great track record. As Nathan Lentz wrote in his review for Science, Darwin devolves fails to challenge modern evolutionary science because, once again, Behe does not fully engage with it. He misrepresents theory and avoids evidence that challenges him.
end quote. I also have to mention that Jerry Coyne actually predicted Darwin Devolves. Remember Behe's paper from 2010 that the book is based on? Criticizing that paper shortly after it came out, Coyne said, quote, When Behe produces a paper like this, it's hard to resist imputing a motivation for the work. After all, the man has a long history of promoting ID. I believe, and I think that time will prove me right, that his intention is to show that evolution cannot provide new structures or new information, for example genes, but can only either tinker with ones already present or degrade them. Thus, to explain the evolution of truly new genetic information, one must invoke the intervention of an intelligent designer. End quote. So that was Jerry Coyne, almost a decade ago, exactly predicting what Behe did in fact do. So props to Jerry Coyne for that prediction. I originally wanted to close on an affirmation of naturalism, which, according to Sean Carroll, is the basic lesson we've learned from the past few centuries of modern science. However, I covered most of what I would say about naturalism a few podcasts ago in episode 49. Instead, I wanted to change the subject a little bit and turn to the creationist fixation on the randomness involved in Darwinism, which they seem to ascribe metaphysical significance to. They make the mistake of thinking that if any randomness whatsoever is involved in the evolutionary process, this means the whole process is random, everything is an accident, also we live in a purposeless cosmos and should probably kill ourselves. And this is of course absurd, both in the understanding of evolution and in the hysterical extrapolations. Randomness does play a role in evolution and the history of life on Earth, but evolution by natural selection is not a random process. Arising according to laws of nature is not at all the same thing as totally random accident. Mutations are seemingly random. Variation may be random, but natural selection is definitely not random. The randomness that seems to be involved in mutation and creating variation, or the randomness involved in historical contingencies, shouldn't cause us to lose any sleep. Randomness in evolution is no more metaphysically significant than randomness in weather systems. Creationists seem to think that if it's not conscious design all the way down, then there can never be purpose or meaning or morality. I would reply that purpose can emerge. In order to be real, it doesn't have to exist there at the fundamental levels of reality. Tables and chairs are real, even though they don't exist at the fundamental levels of reality. And the same goes for economics and comedy and morality and most things, actually. Most things don't exist at the very beginning or the most fundamental level and they are nonetheless real. Just because there was no plan that led to you being here doesn't mean your life is meaningless, or morality isn't real. Evolution by natural selection does not force one to that conclusion. Evolution also happens to be true, so it wouldn't matter if it did imply your life was meaningless. Being an evolved ape and living in a naturalistic universe need not be a source of agony unless we make it so. Our situation simply doesn't warrant the distress creationists seem to think it would. And again, this has no bearing on whether or not it's true. There are, of course, pros and cons to any worldview. I'd rather risk accepting the truth about our origins than tell what I foolishly believe to be a noble lie about God-given purpose and design, which creationists like Ken Ham have admitted partially motivates their resistance to evolution. William Jennings Bryan, prosecutor in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial, explicitly and at length argued that acceptance of evolution would destroy morality, especially for the youth and that studying evolution, quote, corrupts the moral nature of those who become obsessed with it. So in case you thought this was all just a non sequitur, creationists really do worry about the effect evolution will have on us, which partially motivates their denial of it. But I refuse to accept that to believe in religion is to live a life full of happiness and purpose, and we're obligated to be gloomy about a naturalistic view of life. Life is no less beautiful in a naturalistic universe. After an admittedly rough transition, my life has improved without religion, and my appreciation for the time I have here has only increased. It's amazing to contemplate the fact that we're a part of nature, not separate from it. Many have expressed similar feelings, from Carl Sagan to Christopher Hitchens, not just with regard to naturalism, but evolution specifically. There is grandeur in this view of life, as Darwin wrote. It is interesting to contemplate an entangled bank clothed with many plants of many kinds, with birds singing on the bushes, with various insects flitting about, and with worms crawling through the damp earth, and to reflect that these elaborately constructed forms, so different from each other and dependent on each other in so complex a manner, 
have all been produced by laws acting around us. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been, and are being, evolved. That's all I have for you today. If you'd be so kind, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Emerson Green, linked in the description. And a couple of you asked me about giving one-time donations instead of regular Patreon support, so I opened a Venmo account to make that easier, at Emerson Green Podcast on Venmo, if you're inclined to give that way, instead of on Patreon. And speaking of making the show possible, I'd like to thank all my beautiful patrons and of course my patron hall of fame, Jesta, Phil Stilwell, Richard Crossan, Nathan Grounds, and Pre Nifty. And you can support this show on a per-episode basis at patreon.com slash counter where you can earn early access to every episode and access to bonus episodes. If you don't have the money to support on Patreon but you still want to put the evil in evolution, you can find me on Facebook, leave a five-star review, or tell your friends about the podcast. Our theme music was written and performed by the band Whalers. The song is called Magic Tricks and was used with permission. Thank you for joining me today. I've been Emerson Green, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.